Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume and we are all the way to the year 2008, which I can't believe we've come this far on this series. There's an entire playlist of This Year in Perfume if you want to check them out. Basically the idea is fragrances from my collection that were released in this year and then ranking them in my favorites to wear. Now, this is just my favorites to wear, so I'm not saying they're the best made perfumes or anything like that, but Ask me tomorrow, the, the list could change. Obviously our taste changes as, as we grow. Um, and But as of right now, as of January the 6th, 2024, I, I this is my ranking of my favorites to wear, okay? So that's the way you have to look at this. I'm not saying number one is better than number 10, not saying number two is better than number nine, so forth and so on. Uh, this is all just opinion and a fun way to kind of talk about a lot of different perfumes at once, but in an interesting sphere because I think fragrances when they're released in the same year, I think the houses are watching each other, you see similarities, you can pick up on trends, and you can really see fragrances that um, make a huge impact, you know, fragrances that really go against the grain and do something special. So uh, this is actually going to be a top 18, okay? So top 18 list. Uh, so it's gonna be a long one. So hope you got your seatbelt on. And But first, before we talk about what was going on in 2008, I have to talk about my scent of the day because I uh, just did a video on this within the last week, and um, my friend Prakar Gupta has a house called Sherwood. This is the packaging. It looks kind of like just a standard packaging on the outside, but inside, the juice. Oh boy. I mean, I, um, I love this so much I had to wear it again, which uh, I don't always wear the same fragrance twice in the same week like this, unless I'm ready to gear up for a review, but I just, I had to wear this again. I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It's one of the best I think representations of real ambergris I've ever smelled. And ambergris, um, as you all know, is an extremely expensive ingredient. Many times when you see ambergris in a note listing, you're not smelling the real thing. You're smelling some sort of an accord, um, ambroxin, if you will, salty ambroxin, whatever you want to call it. But uh, there's the packaging on the inside, this sort of nice little felt here. And um, on the inside, of course, sits the bottle and it's individually signed by him. And look at the color of the juice. You have to kind of shake it because there's actually uh, little ambergris floats um, bits that are still floating around in there. He said he tried to um, strain it as best as he could, but um, there is still a little bit in there. My bottle is 48 out of 50, and I am in love with this scent. Again, wearing it as my scent of the day today. I sprayed it on a couple hours ago. It is just absolutely heavenly. The way that ambergris comes together with that animalic castorium and oud. There's a little bit of birch tar. You get the um, French iris right from the beginning. Well, maybe a couple minutes in, the iris really starts to make an appearance and rounds everything out. There's other animalic notes. Um, uh, there's multiple types of oud, East Indian oud, Assam oud. There's beautiful rose. There's tobacco absolute. It dries down more to like a um, sort of tobacco-y um, labdenum, like a little bit of an ambery feel, hence the name ambrosia. But I think really more of, than amber, true amber, is the ambergris in here. It is unbelievable. And uh, I think the best thing the House of Sherwood has ever made, hands down. And I haven't smelled them all, but I've smelled a lot of them. And this is my, my favorite, without a doubt. So it was funny, I expected when I did that video, maybe one or two people to buy a bottle, because this is not cheap. This is um, $300 for 30 mils, okay? Um, and he said he had 25 out of 50 bottles left. He said he sold them all in like a day or two, which is unbelievable. So um, to everyone who bought a bottle, I hope you love it as much as I do. And if you don't love it, set it aside, come back to it a couple months later. Uh, sometimes artisanal perfumery can be one of those things where your nose changes as you grow in your journey. And so I, there were many fragrances. I used Ensar's EO2 as an example of this where... First couple times I smelled it, I was kind of on the fence, but now the more I kind of get a chance to experience it, man, I wish I could find a bottle of NSAR's EO number two. Um, anyways, that's my scent of the day, so I just wanted to start with that. So let's um, let's talk about some events in 2008 that were going on. Let's get back to the year 2008. So 2008 for me was um, probably one of the craziest years in my life. There was so much going on. Um, you know, I had just moved out the year before and got my own place. And, you know, when a, when a young man moves out for the first time and lives on his own, it wasn't the first time technically, cause I did live with my buddy, um, after we graduated from, from high school briefly, but it was the first time I had my, my own place that was mine. Um, and, but right in 2008, of course, the main thing for me at the time was the financial crisis and the financial crisis was kind of front and center with my life and job and everything that was going on. 
And um, I just remember the extraordinary news every single day. It just felt like every day another shoe dropped. There was something between Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, and it just went on and on and on, right? So I can't go into much detail. Um, not something that I want to talk about on a channel, on a perfume channel like this, uh, or can talk about, but um, definitely that was the, you know, it felt like anything could happen. There were so many banks that were just on the brink at the time. The... Um, collateralized mortgage obligation crisis that hit. I mean, it felt like big, solid institutions that were around for hundreds of years could instantly go bankrupt. And some of them that survived even were on the precipice. You know, there were rumors that Bank of America could go bankrupt. You know, so many different things were happening back in the year 2008. Um, and then, of course, there was that bailout at the time that ended up happening, which now looking back on it, the money spent, of course, doesn't seem anywhere near as um, as much as they're spending now, right? Uh, but at the time, it was like, holy moly, $150 billion or whatever they printed at the time. Um, and and so there was the bailout that was going on. And that that definitely is the, my biggest memory from 2008. But of course, there were other stuff going on. Um, it, apparently, they were um, Cyprus and Malta uh, adopted the euro, joining 13 other countries using the single currency. That happened in 2008. Um, there was a... Um, there was a, I mentioned the stimulus package, the U.S. government gives the okay to the production of marketing of foods derived from cloned animals. That's interesting. Um, what else? What else? The Iraq war officially uh, cost $3 trillion, which is unbelievable amounts of money. Um, but nothing tops the, um, ah, yes, General Motors did go bankrupt as well. G, uh, GM went through their bankruptcy. So it was just, for me, it was kind of that uh, economic calamity time. It seemed like the stock market would go up and down by huge, huge amounts of volatility at once. Um, and, and so that, that kind of encompasses 2008. As far as songs go, Coldplay put out, uh, Viva La Vida, which I actually really like. Uh, Lil Wayne had Lollipop and, um, what else? What else? Uh, All American Rejects had Gives You Hell, um, Sex on Fire, Kings of Leon, so it was a decent year. If there's other, um, you know, songs that you, that I, obviously I can't mention them all, but uh, there's other songs that were popular in 2008. Drop it in the comments. And uh, also, on the movie side of things, there were some decent movies. The Dark Knight, Slumdog Millionaire, Iron Man. Um, back when I feel that, they, that uh, Marvel was putting out decent movies. And um, what else? There was uh, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Um, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Gran Torino, that was a really good movie if you like Clint Eastwood, Pine Pineapple Express is hilarious, um, Defiance, uh, what else, what else, The Bank Job, um, Meet Bill, Kung Fu Panda, uh, so there were some decent movies in 2008, but, um, okay, so that basically gets us back into the mindset of what was going on in 2008, I remember listening to Offspring's album. I don't know if it was 2008 that it came out, but I remember listening to that album a lot that year, that um, that that Offspring album that came out around that year. So that's what I was doing in 2008. So let's talk perfume. Let's talk about uh, my top 18. But first, we're going to do a honorary mention because this fragrance got a little bit of talk on... Um, actually, I think I want to spray it. Let's get some scripts. I guess I should be prepared when I do these videos, but um, this got some talk on my, um, I did a live stream on the House of Dies and Durga, and this was one of the fragrances I talked a little bit about. However, I don't have a video on it, so I didn't put it on the list. I just gave it like a honorary mention, if you will, and this is called Coriander um, by Dies and Durga, and Dies and Durga is a house that I've actually come to respect. None of them... There's only one, I would say, that really moved me enough to want to go make a full bottle purchase, which was Spirit of the Glen, which is discontinued. But this is a good, spicy take on um, coriander. Coriander kind of has this... So this is Russian coriander, juniper needles, um, cubeb, lime zest, and Moroccan rosemary in the opening. So you kind of get the idea. It's very um, herbal, warm, spicy, nutty, you know, and the citruses definitely come through. You definitely get some of that lime zest. And um, there's a nice lavender absolute that ends up coming through as, as time goes on. 
uh, Mace, Magnolia, and Musk make up the base. They do a good job of sort of adding some of those spices without being overwhelming. And still, you get some of the green aspects of it because it's, um, it's Russian coriander. And from memory, I remember the Russian coriander in here smelling very green, very herbal. You know, there's that herbal um, green nuttiness that ends up coming through. Um, I think coriander smells... I think it smells very close to something like caraway. If you've ever smelled caraway, there's definitely some similarities between coriander and, and caraway. Um, it's used a lot in cooking. Some say there's some similarities, of course, to cilantro as well. But this is just this, um, you know, think about like a little bit of a fennel-like smell, if you will. Um, if you like those kind of fragrances, coriander is definitely one to check out. Okay, so number 18 on the list. Now, one of my most hated fragrances of all time. Absolutely despise this fragrance. It is uh, one of my all-time hates. It easily comes in at the bottom of this list. One of these days, I will uh, gather up the intestinal fortitude and save up all my curses to do a video on this and just bash the shit out of it. But this is uh, Paco Rabanne's One Million. And One Million is like my most hated fragrance. Easily one of my most hated fragrances of all time. Uh, the bottle comes in a gold bar. As if it's not, as if the juice inside wasn't tacky enough, right? And it's just this disgustingly sweet. I mean, anytime I smell one million on someone, it, it just makes me like kind of curl up my nose. You know, I just want to just, just shake them and just be like, what are you doing? Um, but one million is one of the best sellers from the brand, believe it or not. It's a huge clubbing fragrance. A lot of young people like it because it has that sort of um, sweet, sweet, um, Sweet is the best way to describe it. It's just a disgustingly sweet take on a... They say there's things like red, mandarin, orange, peppermint. If you've ever smelled this, I don't know if you can pick any of those notes out. It just smells like a disgusting sweet blob to me. And um, there's an amber note in the base called Amber Ketal. And it's like a, one of the worst amber woods, in my opinion. I despise the smell of this. And amazingly, um, for a, a fragrance that took off like one million. There are very few fragrance houses that use that Amber Ketal note. I don't know if it's just because it's a Gibodon captive molecule or I don't know what it is, but um, uh, in Parfumo, there, it says there's only this and one other fragrance from a house I've never heard of called Eric Corman called September that use it. Um, but uh, definitely, you know, if you're, if, if uh, you're into sweet fragrances, you can give this a try, but I despise one million. So yes, one day that will definitely get a proper, a proper ram bashing. Okay, next on the list is actually, now that I'm thinking about it, um, if you want to have an alternative to, to one million, let's say, but you don't want to smell as disgustingly sweet, these both came out in the year 2008, both from the house of Paco Rabanne, but this is called Ultra Red Man. And Ultra Red Man is actually the one that I would go with. It's still sweet, uh, but for some reason it doesn't give me that as disgusting vibe as one million. Um, there's a little bit of fruitiness in here. It still uses that blood orange note. Uh, well, I guess in one million it's red mandarin orange, but they both smell very similar to that blood orange. Um, and there is tonka bean, vanilla, and praline in here. But um, this, some people compare this to um, Cherry Mugler's Ultra Zest, which um, I think I might have a, a decant floating around. Rich Mitch may have sent me a decant. That's discontinued, but that also has a blood orange note with that Amen DNA, like an orange creamsicle, right? This is like in between those two fragrances. You know, it's in between One Million and Ultra Zest, if you will. So Ultra Red Man, which I believe Ultra Red Man is, I think it's still, well, it says it was last marketed by Puy, so maybe it is officially discontinued. Um, but if you like that sweet designer style, but you want something, I think just one step up from One Million you could go with um, Ultra Red Man. Okay, so that was number 17. Number 16 is actually a Thierry Mugler fragrance. I'm sorry, that is not correct. We're gonna do a, a decant first. I, I did include some, some samples because 2008 to me kind of feels like the year where this explosion of, of scents hit the scene. I mean, there were obviously building up to this, but 2008 just feels like that sort of line in the sand where you got all these different brands, Lalabo, um, what else? You got stuff like Montal and um, 
it, I mean, the releases abound, the flankers, everything just started happening in 2008 that many frag heads nowadays despise, right? And in, in 2008, there was a release from the house of Mansara. That's another house where you just got an explosion of scents. And if you look at Mansara's portfolio, from the time that they um, were created, basically, until now, which has only, I think, been 16 years or whatever it is, 17 years, um, they've got like 100 plus releases. How is that possible? Uh, it seems like they're, what are they, releasing something every week? It's unbelievable. Well, this is one of them. Somebody, um, I think Daver might have sent me this. So that was almost like a, um, it was almost like a sly, I think. Haha, -ha, here you go. Take this one, Ramsey. And I did. I actually reviewed it. So if you want to see my full review, this is number um, 16 on the list. This is from the House of Mansara, and it's called Intensitive Oud. This is the gold version, by the way. Even though he didn't write it, it's the gold version. Uh, it's the gold version of Intensitive Oud. And this just basically feels like a rose oud like a traditional designer rose oud. It doesn't feel like it is worth $180, whatever Mancera is selling it for. Um, there is a ton of, there's an ambergris note in here, actually. If you want to smell the difference between real ambergris and that ambergris note that you smell and everything that they say is ambergris, but is really like ambroxan thing, um, check, check this one out. This is a great example of the differences. And you'll, you'll definitely be able to tell instantly the difference between real ambergris and stuff like this. Um, so there's this white musky ambergris thing going on, but it's basically a rose oud musk is really what it is. If you want to get into more details on this, I have a full review on the channel of Intensitive Oud. But um, needless to say, I'm not a fan and I, and I don't own any Mancera as well. Actually, that's not true. I have a, um, I might have one. I'd have to check. Uh, I might have one that I need to sell one of these days, but um, I never sell my fragrances. So even though I have something and I and I don't like it or wear it, I usually just keep it because maybe I want to reference it later on or, you know, for the channel, show it for the channel, stuff like that. But not a house I'm a fan of. I do not like Mansara or Montal. Um, so this comes in at number 16. Number 15, now we go to the Thierry Mugler, and this is actually a flanker of Amen, which I love the Amen flankers, and it's kind of one of those things. It's like a... Um, how would you call it? Like, like a guilty pleasure. Okay. That's a good way to put it. It's really like a guilty pleasure to, to like these because yes, they are sweet, but I really like the DNA of the Amen series. And this particular one from 2008 is called Pure Coffee and it's discontinued. Um, it goes for pretty big money on eBay actually. Um, and Pure Coffee is, as you can imagine, it's Amen DNA with coffee. So they got a bunch of different ones. They've got pure leather. They've got taste of fragrance. Um, they have all kinds of flankers. They've got a ton of different flankers here. Um, but I actually really like pure coffee. It's um, coffee, patchouli, musk, cedar, and vetiver. And if you like that, amen DNA, okay? So if you like things like animal, animal for men, or just that DNA in general, Angel, the original angel by Thierry Mugler, I would urge you to check out pure coffee. Pure Coffee, yes, it is a little bit sweet, but I think that they do that gourmand sweetness very well. This is actually a collaboration between Jacques Houclier and Christine Nagel, who's now the in-house perfumer at Hermes, right? And um, I think this is a special fragrance. I, it's one of my favorite coffee fragrances to wear. It just is. There aren't uh, too many coffee fragrances that I have that I, could, that I would grab and, and say, you know what, if I want a coffee note, this is what I, I would go for. The original Amen has a coffee note, which is really nice. Um, someone sent me a sample of New Harlem, which has a decent coffee note, which I don't own. Uh, there's a pretty nice coffee note in Civet by Zoologist. Actually, I think I might have done a, This Is Not a Top 10 Coffee, or maybe it was like coffee and tea or something like that. So you can go check that out if you want. But um, but yeah, as far as coffee fragrances go, I, I absolutely love this. I love wearing it. Um, I'm just a fan of that Amen DNA, and it's a shame that they just gutted this whole line. This is great designer perfume, in my opinion. This is what designer perfume should be. So yes, as far as as far as um, as far as flankers go, some of those Amen flankers are some of my favorites of all time. So Amen Pure Coffee at number fifteen. Number fourteen is a uh, fragrance that doesn't get a lot of talk, and it's interesting because it's a niche house. And it's a niche house that has a lot of things that I guess modern YouTubers 
like, you know, it's got the bling, it's got the fancy jewels on top, it's got the elegant bottle, it's got, you know, look at the detailing on the, on the bottle. You can see it says right here, um, it says Desert Shake, Designer Shake Arabia, Desert Prince is what it says. Desert Prince Designer Shake Arabia. Um, and so you can see the cap is, is heavy, it's got the emerald jewel on top, it's got a pretty badass bottle. I mean, the bottle feels good in the hand. The juice inside is not bad. This is, um, I don't know if you can read that, but that actually says made in Bahrain. And um, this is a fragrance that, um, a fragrance house, I should say, that I think tried to do what Amouage did. <clears throat> I think they saw what was going on at Amouage with Oman, and they were like, you know what? Bahrain needs its own version of Amouage, right? So they created this house, but the problem is, is they only released a handful of scents. They've got this, they've got, um, They've got sh what they call Chic Shack number, Chic Shake number 30 for women, which is the women's version of, of this, basically, I think. This one's called number 70. It came out in 2008. In 2013, <clears throat> they put out one called um, Opulent Shake um, Gold Collection, which I also own. And that's it. That's all That's all they put out, basically. They, they put out... Um, Maybe one or two others, but that's it. So they have like five or six fragrances for the whole for the whole house. So it's like they released a couple. They say they're still in production, and then they just stopped. You know, they just for whatever reason they stopped, and I and I don't know why. Um, but um, because the juice inside is actually not bad. It um, you know what this smells like to me? Chic Shake Number Seventy. It smells like a better version of excuse me, Creed Spice and Wood. I think this is a really good take on like a woody, like a fresh woody fragrance. I love wearing this in summer because yes, you get the sandalwood and musk in the base, but there's a lot of citruses and clary sage and a little bit of florals, but it just stays very fresh. And if you know Spice and Wood, you know, uh, you'll, you'll have an idea of the DNA that I'm talking about. I actually think I prefer this to Spice and Wood. So, but it's in that same ballpark to me for sure. Chic Shake number 70, um, I wouldn't run out and go spend big money, but if you can get it under a hundred bucks, like I did, it might not be a bad deal. So number 14 is Chic Shake number 70. Number 13 is a Eldo fragrance, an Atat Libre d'Orange. And this is a very interesting fragrance that somebody made a comment on my channel recently. They said, you know, they went from a fragrance with maybe one of the most suggestive advertisements of all time to one of the most boring names ever. So this is called Tom of Finland. And if you know Tom of Finland, you'll know exactly where I'm going with this because Tom of Finland um, was a pseudonym for a, for a Finnish artist who basically is almost like the godfather of homoerotic art, if that makes sense. He is like the um, they consider him, his Wikipedia page says he's been called, quote, the most influential gay porno, pornogra pornographic image, image, uh, by cultural historian, Joseph W. Slay. So look up some of the images of Tom of Finland at your own risk. Uh, however, I will tell you that, um, they went from Tom of Finland to a name called Clean Suede. They rebranded this. I don't know if they're, um, if they're... Uh, contract with Tama Finland went away or whatever it is, but now it's called Clean Suede, which you know what? It's actually a name that describes the fragrance pretty well, except for I think that um, in the top there's this aldehydic lemon tart like smell. If you've ever smelled, if you've ever had eaten like a lemon tart, um, like a pastry with that lemon, um, you know, mix. It, it feels like that. It feels like you're eating a lemon tart or maybe like lemon meringue pie in the top and that lemon aldehyde with the clean suede and birch makes it feel, you know, the vanilla gets heavier as the fragrance dries down, but it makes it feel, um, it uh, makes it feel much safer than it could have been for a fragrance that has this bombastic name and advertising campaign and everything. Um, it doesn't feel like it's such a bombastic fragrance. You know, it feels very likable, very wearable, very, um, doesn't feel as out there as it could have been if they really wanted to make a fragrance that matched the original name. So Clean Suede, I think, matches it better, but um, this will always be Tama Finland. To me, that's just what it is. And the, um, I think the vanilla in here, or the vanillin or whatever they use in here, as air gets into the bottle, the fragrance turns darker. 
So when you first get your bottle, it'll probably be clear. As air gets in there, you're going to see it turn darker. So the, um, I wouldn't be, I don't know if, I don't know if Eldo has sort of reformulation issues or not. I honestly have never heard anyone complain about reformulation from the House of Eldo. But, um, but yes, this is kind of a, uh, le leathery lemon meringue pie like smell. It's, it's okay. It's, I like my leather fragrances a little bit more challenging, more castorium and more sort of, um, harsh spices and stuff like that. This is a safer take on leather, but I still like it. Uh, so Tom of Finland by Eldo at number 13, number 12. So we actually have back to back Amouages. Okay. Um, and one I have a bottle and one I don't. So number 12 is actually Amouage's Lyric Man, which is crazy because this is one of my favorite rose fragrances of all time, and yet it ended up at number 12 on the list. So um, basically, Lyric Man is an interesting fragrance because this is one of those fragrances where it's marketed towards men, but most men who are not used to heavy rose fragrances, when they first smell this, they're going to say it's too feminine, right? And I did as well. I remember I smelled this about a decade ago, and I remember going, this is not for me. This is um, way too feminine. There's way too much of that fresh rose in here. Um, there's a huge dose of lime and rose when you first spray. And I was like, man, I, I can't do this. Like I had, and I gave it to my mother, right? Uh, and then as the years wore on, I remember thinking about this fragrance, like, man, why, why did I give up on this? Because Remember, like I said earlier with Sherwood, your nose changes as time goes on. And I was craving some rose scents, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to this. And I did. I bought a bottle, and I've been wearing it, and I absolutely love it. Um, but that very clean uh, sort of piercing rose, it's a very piercing rose. So it's rose, lime, angelica, uh, pine. So there are some green touches. There, There is a little bit of that frankincense you expect from an amouage. But um, it is very, ro very fresh rose centered, centered. And I think that fresh rose centered leans more towards feminine rose fragrances, traditionally feminine rose fragrances. I think anyone can wear anything. Um, I do think this would smell amazing on a woman. But um, uh, I think Amouage did a little bit of the, of the trickery because I think they put the more feminine, traditionally feminine fragrance in the masculine bottle. And the more traditionally masculine fragrance, which is number 11 on the list, Amouage Lyric Woman, which I have a sample, or I had a sample. I did a video on it off of that sample, and I can't find it. Finding samples is like the bane of my existence, okay? So um, I looked, and I looked, and I and I just can't find it. I wanted to show you guys the sample. I think I, think I had a couple drops still. I just can't find it. Um, but it is at number 11. Lyric Woman is one step ahead of Lyric Man to me. Uh, you can go check out my review of Lyric Woman if you would like, but Lyric Woman is, I think, more traditionally masculine because it has more of these heavier uh, animalic notes that go along with the rose. So there's also some florals that they've added, but I think they added more like patchouli and sandalwood and um, vetiver. And so I think um, because they did that, it, it makes it less, less clean and piercing and, and more rich, more full. So yes, it is still a rose-based fragrance, but even though it's... Um, I think the woman's version is more masculine and the, and, the, and the man's version is more traditionally feminine, if that makes sense. But I, I love them both. But Lyric Woman just gets the nod to me. I'd love a Lyric Woman bottle one of these days. It's, it's on the never-ending wish list to buy. Um, okay, so next on the list is another sample that I have a video on. So back-to-back -back samples I have videos on that I can't find. But um, you can go check it out on my channel. If you look up uh, Frederick Marl's Dante Bra, you'll find this. This is uh, one of my favorite... Cashmere, <clears throat> excuse me, Cashmeran fragrances. Um, it's kind of a floral, spicy take on Cashmeran, and Cashmeran has this very silk-like feel, cashmere feel, if you will, hence the name Cashmeran. It really feels like you're wearing a cashmere coat. Some people really don't like Cashmeran. It's a very cheap material. It can smell like bounty. It can smell like bounty soft. You know, it can smell like um, almost like uh, you're smelling like um, those bounty dryer sheets, right? It gives some of that musky, fresh feel. But the way Maurice Roussel used it, this overdose of cashmeran, and I know Frederick Mall also loves cashmeran, and mixes it with um, violet, heliotrope, white musk, and sandalwood. I love it. I, I would love a bottle of, of Dante Bra, even though this is marketed towards women. Uh, I was a big fan. You know, it was one of those things where if I could find a pre- 
Estee Louder bottle at a fair price, or even a partial, half a bottle, I would do it. Um, I think I would do it one of these days because it, uh, I think it's full bottle worthy and it's absolutely beautiful. So Dante Bra comes in at number uh, 10. Number nine is another sample, but this is more of a fresh review. I did this review within the last month, I believe. Uh, and this is called Incense Rose, or as someone pointed out to me, it's actually, there's that asterisk over the E, so it's Incense Rosé. And uh, you can go check out my full review for more details on the, on the fragrance itself, but basically there's a huge clementine note in here that gives this sort of sparkly fizziness. And someone left a comment saying that sort of sparkly fizziness you're getting, Ramsey, is because it's supposed to be rosé. It's like a rosé champagne, right? So the rose the fizziness from the clementine, but the clementine sticks around. It does not go away from memory. And that rose note really makes an appearance strong in a couple hours. It doesn't come on right away. You get a lot of the spices, you get the cardamom, and you get the clementine at first. And that clementine note, if you've ever seen those drinks called Izzy, uh, Izzy has a clementine, sort of like a sparkling juice thing. And that is what the clementine note reminded me of. But whenever the rest of the fragrance develops, it's beautiful. Probably one of the best rose fragrances that's not in my collection. I absolutely love Incense Rosé. Um, so Incense Rosé and Lyric Woman are two rose fragrances I would love to add to the collection. One of, one of these days, they're beautiful fragrances. There's this resinous myrrh, beautiful Texas cedar, vetiver, and patchouli in the base. But the frankincense, the incense, mixing with the rose when it, when it actually hits and comes together, brilliant. So check out my review of um, Towers, Andy Towers Incense Rosé at number nine. Number eight. Number eight on the list is another discontinued fragrance. I'd love to add to the collection one day, but impossible. You know, you can't own everything, right? It's just impossible to own everything. So this is from the house of Tom Ford, and this is called Italian Cypress. And again, I have a review of this on the channel if you want to check it out. But Italian Cypress... Um, takes heavily from probably one of Tom Ford's most influential fragrances of his lifetime, which was Halston Z14. This is, um, interestingly enough, these are both older bottles. They're both um, Halston Fragrances Inc. if you turn them over on the bottom. But this one says Parfums Halston. This one says Halston Fragrances Inc. And the splash bottle says Made in France, which is crazy to me because... Um, I thought all Halston fragrances were made in the USA. So I don't know if his early batches were made in France. I don't know what is going on with that. But um, that is Halston Z14. And Halston Z14 is going to get a, call it a Hall of Fame review from me one of these days. It is a Hall of Fame fragrance. Even though people view it as a cheapie uh, because it was at TJ Maxx for so many years, it's not a cheap fragrance. I think Max Gavari and Vincent uh, Marcello did just an amazing job with Z14, that sort of spicy, woody fragrance that influenced generations. I mean, you could name fragrances from every decade, I think, that came out that had Z14's DNA in them. You know, you think about things like Clive Christian's X. I can smell bits of D Z14 in there. You think about things like um, uh, Valentino's Vendetta, Poron. That has bits of Z14 in there. And um, you think about, of course... Tom Ford's Italian Cypress, which came out in 2008, or else it wouldn't be on this video, of course. Um, that came out, that, that has bits of uh, Z14, lots of it. And probably the newest fragrance that came out that is inspired by Z14 is Roja's Apex. So in my opinion, if you want a niche fragrance that really harkens back to Z14 and keeps the soul of Z14, go for Italian Cypress. Italian Cypress remains true to Z14, a little more than the Roja. Roja, you can smell the Z14, um, you know, you can smell the inspired by, but he Rojas it up, as I'm constantly saying with his fragrances. It really feels like he is taking something from the past and really trying to um, modernize it and change bits and pieces here and there. And so he added things like pineapple. So people started instantly saying, oh, it's a Ventus. It's not. It's Z14 with a little bit of pineapple and um, he loves adding little bits and pieces. He also added a rum note to Apex, which harkens back to Vendetta, because there's a rum uh, note in Valentino Uomo's, uh, Valentino Vendetta Porom, 
which, you know, gives little bits and pieces of Z14. So Italian Cypress is one in a long line, but the thing about Tom Ford in particular is that Italian Cypress or um, Z14, the House of Halston in general, is what really influenced Tom Ford. Tom Ford bought Roy, Roy Frowick Halston's house uh, after he um, passed away, and he actually, I think he lives there. I think he lives in in um, Roy Halston's house. That's how influential Halston as a house was to Tom Ford. And the most influential of all of the masculine fragrances from Halston is Z14, which, which really sort of, you know, Z14 is what really inspired Italian Cypress. So Italian Cypress, uh, you can go check out my review, but I really like the Cypress note in here. It really gives off that beautiful medicinal woodiness that cypress gives off. There's also an old school carnation note added in here, which I love because that gives it a little bit of an homage to the past, which I wish more masculine fragrances added some of some touches like that. You know, the old school carnation. Um, I love the carnation and vintage masculines. Things like Abbey Rouge are just beautiful. So um, yes, Italian Cypress by Z14 comes in at number eight for me. Number seven. Now, again, this is where you have to remember, these are based on my personal taste. I'm not saying these are the best fragrances necessarily, but I'm saying these are my favorites to wear. So number seven is Cartier's Roadster. And I think if you went off of just, you know, the blend and the way it's put together, you would have to put Italian Cypress above something like Roadster. You'd have to put Dante Bra above Roadster. But there's something about Cartier's Roadster that I absolutely adore. Uh, I love wearing this. Unfortunately, I only have 50 mils. So, you know, I wear it sparingly, but um, I'll, I'll, this is going to get a, a full review, absolutely. This sort of fresh green, this also has cashmeran. So it's interesting, because I guess cashmeran technically is an amber wood. It's a, it's a synthetic material that, um, that is used like amber woods. You know, amber woods are used to add this unbelievable push to a fragrance, right? They really project. And um, if you get a fragrance with heavy amber woods on your clothes, you can smell it for weeks, sometimes months. It's unbelievable. Um, and, and cashmeran is one such ingredient where it's kind of um, cheap to produce. It can be used in uh, as, as sort of uh, in large quantities in a fragrance, and it's not expensive to use. But there's a cashmeran note in Roadster. But to me, Roadster is all about that sort of patchouli mint, and then that resinous base. I love the labdanum and um, the vetiver and the base of Roadster. Um, and it's very fresh and green and, and herbal and beautiful for the heat. This is a lovely fragrance for the heat. Now, some people say it's too heavy for the heat. I love wearing heavy fragrances all the time. So I like, even in the summer, sometimes I just like wearing a fragrance that's heavy. And this is a fragrance that's made for someone like me who likes heavier fragrances but still wants to wear something that's, let's say, season-specific because of that mint note, the freshness, the green sort of freshness. Just beautiful. Shame they discontinued Cartier's Roadster. And apparently this is supposed to be like a throwback to the dial, the watch dial um, of the Roadster watch. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Many of the fragrances that Cartier puts out for men has a corresponding watch that goes along with it. So like um, you think about Santos, there's a, there's a watch, a Santos Cartier watch, um, and there's a Roadster watch. So yes, I mean, I, I love Roadster. I'm so sad it's discontinued. I think uh, Cartier made a huge mistake discontinuing Roadster. But it's all about, you know, sales, and obviously it wasn't selling. So Cartier's Roadster by Mathilde Laurent comes in at number seven. Number six is a Guerlain, and actually I have a comparison video on the channel. So for those of you new to my channel, I have put out almost 800 videos in the last couple years. So go back and go back through my history and watch some of those older videos. There's a playlist set up for every single house. So you can go and go house by house and look at all the fragrance videos I've done, or you can just go back through my history. But one of them is Guerlain, and this is called Lame Dune Eros, which is basically like the soul of a hero or something like that, spirit of a hero, if you will. Um, and it came out in 2008 because the original fragrance that Lame Dune Eros was sort of based on is called Guerlain's Coriolan. And Coriolan was created by the great Jean-Paul Guerlain. It came out in the late 90s. Um, and I actually have a second bottle of this, which I can't find. It's just like I couldn't find my decan. I can't find a bottle, which uh, just goes to show how much perfume I have. 
But um, there is a, I've got a second bottle of this, which I've been using, which is much lower than, than this one. One of the most beautiful bottles, though. I think this is supposed to be like a, um, almost like a gunpowder pouch, if you will, where they would pack pack the gun, take the gunpowder out to, to um, sort of, you know, get the, get the muskets, get the muskets going. Um, but yes, I love, I love the bottle. I love the design. Um, unfortunately, this absolutely bombed in sales. And it's interesting because there's a theory out there that says that Jean-Paul Guerlain started working on this fragrance decades before. He was working on Coriolan um, at the same time as Guerlain Derby. Derby came out in the mid-80s, 85, 86. This came out in 98, I believe. This got discontinued almost within like one year. This was the last major project that LVMH allowed Jean-Paul Guerlain to work on. His last great masculine release, if you will. And I do think this is a great fragrance. I think it's extremely underrated. Um, basically, the reason I'm speaking so much about Coriolan is because um, Lame Dune Eros is a recreation of Coriolan. And basically what they've done is, is um, they have brought it back. They brought it back in this um, Corio, I can't spell, Coriolan. There we go. So they brought it back in the wood-framed bottles that they called, um, oh, crap. Uh, I forgot what those wood-framed bottles were, but um, I love those bottles. I, I would love a bottle of this. Well, I don't need a bottle of this because I have Coriolan, but I'd love a bottle of things like uh, La Frenchy. Um, I'd love a bottle of Derby in that square bottle. I would, uh, I mean, I'd, I have a comparison video on Derby on the channel between the OG and the, the square bottle, if you will. Um, and I think those square bottles are some of the best reformulations ever made. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting, Thierry Vosser was on the Perfume Guys channel, Sebastian's channel recently, and he said, Thierry Vosser doesn't like work by Thierry Vosser, is literally what he said. He goes, uh, you know, I don't like the stuff I create, uh, is, is kind of what he said some, sometimes is what he, is how, is what he was saying. Um, but I think some of the best work Thierry Vosser did for Guerlain was reformulating some of those fragrances in the square, wood square bottles. Derby is an amazing reformulation. Lame Dune Eros is an amazing reformulation. They added some things that were missing. And I talked about this on the comparison video between these two, because these two are basically the same fragrance. Just different name. Guerlain loves changing the name of a fragrance and reissuing it. They just did it with Gourmand Coquine. They just reissued it in a new bottle just now. Different name, same exact fragrance. So I hate that Guerlain does that, to be honest with you. But they have so many fragrances that I see why they do that. Because they can just cycle through them. You know, they've got so many, such a robust and vibrant past, right? Um, and so this is basically like a spicy, woody fresh Chypre. So imagine like the leathery, I'm sorry, lemony, um, bergamot, you know, petit gras, like freshness of old school Chypres from the past. Think about things like Chanel's Pour Monsieur, the EDT, or think about things like uh, Capucci Pour Homme, right? Capucci Pour Homme is like old school Chypre from the past. Those very big lemony citrusy uh, Chypres for men. And just imagine mixing it with herbal coriander, which we talked about earlier, ginger, um, nutmeg, and um, pepper, ylang ylang, oak moss, definitely oak moss, especially in the OG. But even the new one smells like there's oak moss in there. Patchouli, vetiver, benzoin, and leather. And so I think in the new one, they've added a couple things that um, had to be added to, you know, keep it keep its soul while stay excuse me, if for compliance. So they added things like absinthe. They added things like everlasting flower. Um, but Coriolan is, again, beautiful in the uh, heat. I think it's amazing, Chypre, to wear in the heat. If you want to smell masculine, but also classy, um, this is... Oh, baby. I don't... I think I just sprayed this bottle for the first time because my other bottle is somewhere else, but... Um, oh, it's just beautiful. I can smell it already. You definitely get that fresh, like, Neroli, Petit Grand. I think uh, in, in Lame Dune Eros, um, Terry Vosser substituted Lemon Blossom for the Petit Grand, but you definitely, it almost opens up with a Creed-like freshness. You know, there's this 
unbelievable burst of, of freshness. And then it dries down more to the peppery oak moss, vetiver, patchouli. It's a, it's amazing. It's really underrated, extremely underrated fragrance. For the heat, I love wearing stuff like this. Some of my secret weapons are stuff like this to wear in the heat. I love these, um, these old school, you know, citrus heavy sheepras for the heat, which, um, uh, many people don't like wearing those kind of fragrances in the heat, but I really do. So Lame Dune Eros from 2008. What a brilliant collection that they came out with. And that, that, that came in at number six, number five. Number five is, uh, it's tough to put this here because this is literally my favorite incense or one of my favorite incense fragrances of all time. I did an Andy Tower or Tower Perfumes family portrait, ranked family portrait just recently. And um, this was pretty high up on the list. This is my vintage bottle of Incense Extreme. This is what the old Andy Tower bottles look like uh, before he went to the Pentagon looking bottle. And um, Incense Extreme is probably one of my favorite out and out church incenses because it does that church incense thing that Avignon does so well, but it adds a couple other things in here. It's got that um, ambergris accord that Andy Tower created, which I think is a brilliant creation by, by Mr. Tower. And it's got a little bit of iris, so it sort of softens everything up uh, with a little bit of petit gras and this woodiness, this dry woodiness. This is, and this is an extremely dry fragrance. It's um, it's very smoky and spicy and woody and just dry. You know, it's got that, definitely has touches of cold church incense. Very cold, very cold. Even though you see the flames on the bottle, it's a very cold fragrance. Um, so yes, Incense Extreme. I mean, just a, a beautiful, be one of my favorite towers. And so glad to have this uh, vintage bottle. I think it's cool. So yes, Good old Incense Extreme at number five. Hard to put it number five when it's like your favorite incense, but what what can you say? There's just some amazing fragrances coming up. Actually, two um, Serge, one Histoise de Parfum, uh, and um, an Amouage. So, okay, here we go. So let's do number four. Number four on the list is a Serge Luton, and this is actually Serge Luton, the man himself, his signature scent. And this is called Serge Noir, which again, I have a review of, the, of this on the channel. I have a review of this before um, I actually acquired this bottle. I have a review of this off of a decant. So um, I, I smelled it. I loved it. One of my, um, one of which I would call him a friend, one of my friends who um, basically was like a benefactor, if you will. He reached out and said, hey, man, I've got some connections to Serge. I want to send you some stuff. And I said, okay send them. And he literally sent me like 15 bottles of Surge, 10 bottles or something. Um, and um, very, very kind, generous of him. He said he'd send some more one day, but you know, maybe that day is still in the future. But he sent me some amazing fragrances. And this was one of the ones I requested because I sampled it and I loved it. Um, absolutely loved it. Uh, and this is basically, you know, if you know, um, so if you know uh, Feminita Dubois, right? Which I know is one of the most influential fragrances of all time. The femininity of wood. The reason I bring that up is if you know the way that the cedar, the wood is used in there, just imagine a thicker, richer, darker, smokier version of, um, of Feminita Dubois. There's this, um, let me pull up the note listing here. So there's this charred woods feeling to uh, Serge Noir. It's almost like um, um, it's almost like the woods have been blackened in a sense. And along with that, there's of course frankincense. You get the smoke, but you get the 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 woodiness that feels like it comes directly from Femini to Dubois. And if this is his signature scent for real, I could completely see why because. It takes stuff from the past, which he made with people like Pierre Bourdon and Christopher Sheldrake, and it makes it his own. So it adds heavier spices like clove and cinnamon and elemi. Uh, the elemi, the frankincense and the elemi make it feel sort of, um, there's a little bit of a lemony freshness to the incense here, but it's mixed with a pretty heavy dose of cumin. And that's the spice I think that puts most people off. That cumin 
um, is pretty prominent, pretty evident, uh, pretty, it can challenge some folks. And, and along with the woody, incense-y dry down, you get patchouli and labdanum. And of course, the labdanum is high quality, high class, slightly sticky, ambery, but um, what a fragrance. I mean, I can't believe more people don't talk about this. If you love Femini to Dubois, right? If you're a guy, especially who loves Femini to Dubois, and I think this is unisex as well, but there's no doubt this is much, even a more masculine take on Femini to Dubois to me. Minus the plum and all the other stuff in Femini to Dubois, minus the honey and plum, uh, just focuses on the drier, incensey, woody, spicy elements. I could totally see this being a signature scent for Serge. Totally. It's beautiful. So yes, um, uh, thank you very much to my uh, to my friend who sent me the bottle because that is a, it's an amazing gift. I'll I'll definitely wear the wear the piss out of that. Okay, next on the list is a fragrance that I also have a full review on on the channel. You can go check it out. Um, this particular one is from the House of Histoise de Parfum from 2008, and this is called 1740. And 1740 is uh, probably one of the most underrated leather fragrances in Fragcom, okay, in my opinion, because 1740 is created by Sylvie Jordet and um, Gerard Giselaine, who's the creative director of this house. And this is a spicy, leathery, um, you know, it, uh, the, the name of the fragrance originally was um, uh, Marquis de Sade, Marquis de Sade, okay? And if you know who that is, you know that he was like a little bit of a sexual deviant. Um, he wrote a pretty disgusting book, which you can go check. I think you can still buy it. I don't know. Um, but, um, he was a, a, strange fellow to say the least. He had weird needs and, um, this fragrance is supposed to encompass that and it, and it encompasses this very challenging, um, you know, you're hit with basically this, um, sort of crispy smelling, uh, like imagine, uh, grass that's been so dry that it's almost turned to hay, right? Imagine that with leather and birch and smokiness and woodiness and earthiness and spiciness and it's leathery. And as far as a leather goes, like if you're a fan of um, throwback leathers from the 80s, if you like leathers that are big and bold and in your face, this is a niche version of that from 2008. And I'm just shocked it doesn't get more love. I'm, I'm shocked. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of 1740. And um, actually, I'm a huge fan of this house. I think this house is pretty underrated, Histoise de Parfum. But, um, but yes, if you, um, if you like leathers, if you like my kind of leathers that I hype up on the channel, the Bellamy's, the, um, you know, Antaeus's, those kind of heavier type fragrances, leathers specifically, check out 1740. Go watch my full review if you want more of a detail, in-depth detail on, on the fragrance. Okay, top two. So number two on the list is actually a number two on the list is actually a Serge Luton again, and this is called Five O'clock Au Gingembre. And Five O'clock Au Gingembre is one of my favorite tea-based fragrances of all time. Uh, I love Five O'clock Au Gingembre. It is such a relaxing, beautiful scent, and Christopher Sheldrake absolutely nailed this one. One hundred percent nailed it. Uh, it is, it has this sort of candied ginger with cacao like smell and, um, mixed with this beautiful tea note and honey. And, and if you can just imagine literally dropping, um, if you can just imagine literally dropping honey and letting it dissolve into your tea and you know what it is really, I think the brilliance of this fragrance is the patchouli. And I think his work on Borneo 1834 and what he did with patchouli previously and his understanding. I think Christopher Sheldrake's brilliant understanding and Serge Luton, of course, because I know they work as a team on this. I think his understanding of patchouli made this scent. I really do. I think, um, yes, all of the stuff around, there's a little bit of a biscuit feel. Like imagine, um, imagine like biscuits and tea, okay, which is a very English thing. So, I'm probably not, not the right person, but I do love tea, and um, I actually put half and half in my tea, which I know is a, um, uh, people from England are probably like, half and half, what is wrong with you? But um, 
Yeah, I will put a little half and half in sugar, which I know is also like, you're supposed to take your tea black if you're proper. Black, please. Um, but I, I like it just slightly sweetened. But here, there's this candied, honeyed feel. And that adds to the to the sweetness, if you will. And the um, Serge Luton sort of aesthetic is all around it. And so it's just, I mean, to me, if you said, Ramsey, what is one of the most relaxing scents in your armory? This would be it. There is no doubt about it. Five o'clock Ocean Jambra to me is a masterful release, absolutely masterful. And it's so enveloping, encompassing. It's so, it's literally like being, you know, hugged with warmth. You know when it's cold outside and you take like a big bite of warm soup or you take a big bite or a big sip of, let's say, warm tea. And just, you can almost feel the warmth just going down your entire body, right? That's what this fragrance is like. It's, um, it's, it's beautiful. And the patchouli in here is out. It, actually, the patchouli is not coming out on the strip as well as it comes out on my skin. On my skin, the patchouli note is brilliant. It is a, it is a, it's a woody patchouli. It's beautiful. I love, I love Serge Luton. Definitely, you will see more reviews from the house of Serge Luton. Uh, and so that leaves number one. Now, again, I've told you guys this before, but I go off of Parfumo, okay? And so Parfumo had Jubilation 25 for women come out in 2007, and it had Jubilation 25 for men come out in 2008. So could there be any other number one slot than Jubilation for men, uh, 25 for men? This is Bertrand Duchafour's masterpiece, one of his masterpieces, okay? Good old Birdie D. And you can see, this was my, look at the dent I've put in that bottle. You know, that's a hell of a dent when you have a collection my size. And I love, I don't even need to spray this. I mean, I don't want to waste the juice, to be honest with you. And I've got an OG snap cap bottle as well. And I can tell you they're both good. You know, my bottle of Jubilation 25 for men, you can see it doesn't say it on the side and it doesn't say it here. It just, there's nothing other than, you know, the batch code made in Oman, which is kind of rubbing off, but it does say it here, right here on the front, Jubilation, on, on the um, on the collar, right? So you can kind of get a feel for when it was released. I would guess this is probably within the last eight years, right? This bottle is probably within the last eight years, give or take. And, um, and I love it. You know, they're both, I was thinking about doing a comparison video between the two, but honestly, there's no, I don't think there's a need because this one's fine, this one's fine. The one to avoid, I think, is the one that says it right here on the front from what I've, he from what I've heard. I haven't smelled it, but from what I've heard. And um, it, it, um, it is one of the fragrances, I think, that uh, brought me onto this journey. There were a couple amouages that when I smelled, it was like mind blown. You know, this is... Middle Eastern wealth. This is Oriental spicy with that blackberry note that is perfect. And you know, there's all kinds of little tricks and, and bits in the perfume world that can be used. And Bertrand Duchafour uses them all. He is the magician. You know, he um, finds a way to weave these notes in. So in this case, it's frankincense, blackberry, labdanum, coriander, divana. He loves divana. There's also a divana note in. Um, 1740 by Histoire de Parfum. Um, this actually, if you would have said this is a Bertrand du Chiffre, I, I probably would have believed you. But um, there's clove, cinnamon, celery seed. You definitely get a little bit of that celery seed. It almost smells like you can smell the celery seed. Gaillac wood, which adds a little bit of this burnt wood, this burnt offering wood. Honey, orchid, rose, laurel, which is like this bay leaf-like smell. Myrrh, oud. Atlas Cedar, Moss, Apopanax, Omanian Ambergris, which is very specific, Musk, Patchouli, Tree Moss, and Immortelle. And actually, speaking of Omanian Ambergris, I once heard that 30% of the world's Ambergris, 30 or 40%, naturally because of the currents of the ocean, washes up on the shores of Oman. So that also adds to their perfume empire, if you will. And um, so shout out to the late, great Sultan uh, been Caboos for creating Amouage, um, because, you know, this kind of, these type of perfumes changed my course of fragrance, because it changed my love. It brought me to the fragrance world, really. Uh, Jubilation 25 is one of those fragrances. It is, um, 
it's it's such a beautiful representation of the history of Oman and the history of Amboaj. And I think Bertrand du Chafour absolutely knocked it out of the park. Obviously, um, if you're someone that's only going, if you're going looking for that real oud, that, you know, Russian Adam, Bortnikov, Ensar oud, oud in here, this is not that type of perfume. But the oud note, which you definitely can get in the dry down, mixes with all of these other ingredients that just make up Oman. You know, it's really like an homage to the pat to the history of the House of Amouage. So they recently put out their Jubilation 40, which I've never smelled, but rumor is is that Jubilation 40 just smells like this because the difference between these two is that this just lasts longer, really, in my opinion. I think they both smell so similar, but this one just feels to last longer on the skin. This is like a 12-hour fragrance. This is like an 8-hour fragrance, right? Um, and And so for me... You know, Jubilation 40, $500 for a fragrance that smelled like this before it's been reformulated, let's say. If it's been reformulated, I don't know. I would guess it probably has been, but $500 for an exceptional X-ray that just smells like what it should have smelled like all along? Uh, I don't know, Amouage. I don't know. But uh, I'll, I'll just stick with my... I mean, if someone sends me a decant of Jubilation 40, I'll, I'll talk about it, but I'll probably just say exactly what I said there as my guess from what I heard. But um, you have to trust your own nose, I guess. So I'll, I'll wait to withhold judgment on it until I smell it. But uh, number one, without a question, hands down. So we're at the hour mark. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Let me know what your favorites are from the year 2008. I know, obviously, one man can't have everything. So if there's some from 2008 that I've left off that you love, leave it in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. Thank you for supporting me and watching and commenting and all this good stuff. Appreciate everyone. Cheers, guys. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.